Thank you, Michael, for the introduction. Good morning, everyone. Uh, my name is Orion Gabramedin. Uh, the topic of my presentation this morning is forces of technology uh, driving the big data revolution. Uh, in order to make it easy uh, to understand the goals of the, this presentation, I'd like to share uh, a brief outline. Um, I'll start by summarizing uh, the major forces that are uh, challenging our current approaches to uh, data warehousing. And then I'll present uh, a brief um, historical description of the need for uh, big data processing tools and the fundamental pr principles behind them. Uh, and since Hadoop is the most uh, significant big data processing tool, I'll focus on some of the details of its architecture. Uh, in order to provide uh, a practical description of the application of big data processing. I'll also talk about big data solution deployment models and um, how they impact the way we architect the modern data warehouse. Uh, finally, uh, I'll summarize my uh, uh, presentation and then I'll leave the room open for uh, question and answers. So uh, let's start by uh, covering um, the forces challenging traditional data warehousing approach. So um, anyone who's dealt with uh, data warehousing uh, clearly understand that traditionally uh, the process involved uh, moving data from uh, various data source systems into or uh, through a data model uh, designed for analytics and reporting. Uh, in majority of these cases, uh, it involved uh, moving, the, moving and staging the data into a central location that we uh, refer to as uh, data warehouse. However, uh, in recent years, a lot of the forces born out of this uh, new world of data are challenging this traditional approach. Um, some of these forces can be summarized into uh, three uh, major categories. Um, I'll start with the, the, the last one, which is clearly the emergence of various uh, cloud-based uh, business applications. Uh, we also have a, sh a shift in the trend uh, in the significance of data that's outside uh, the organization, as well as the emergence of new uh, data sources. And then uh, clearly we have big data challenge. Um, since uh, big data is the main topic of this presentation, uh, let me start by getting uh, the other two out of the way first. So um, let's talk about uh, shifting trends in data sources. So um, traditionally, uh, business intelligence has been focused uh, on uh, using the data that's been generated by the enterprise uh, to make important uh, business decisions um, versus in the new world of data, uh, critical business decisions are actually increasingly dependent on data that's generated by sources outside the enterprise. Uh, this includes uh, social media uh, trending, uh, social media sentiment analytics, uh, marketing analytics for uh, feedback and reviews on products and services, for example. Uh, uh, also, uh, web analytics for uh, change in the web traffic activity as a response to um, product announcements, product releases. Uh, and um, in addition, there is an increasing uh, requirement for uh, a very near real-time analytical uh, reporting capability, um, as well as the need to provide uh, decision-making capabilities while the data is still in flight. Uh, that's what we call stream analytics. Um, moreover, you know, in addition to the uh, hindsight data mining capabilities, there is uh, a greater need for advanced uh, predictive uh, solutions uh, for critical business decision making. Uh, that's more uh, more related to uh, machine learning. So let's talk about the next um, force that's challenging the way we're doing data warehousing. So uh, most traditional business processes, uh, they have some sort of local footprint in terms of uh, processing and storage. Um, However, you know, in the recent days, with a focus on cloud-first applications, most of these business processes, uh, you know, they use these cloud-born applications that don't even have a local footprint uh, for storage or for processing. And uh, with, uh, you know, massive deployment of uh, various uh, data sensors, 
uh, intelligent devices or you know the things that we now call um, internet of things data is directly sent to the cloud so when we're talking about an enterprise that's trying to make uh, better business decisions uh, you know that that uh, account for all these uh, sensors and Internet of Things, as well as the local um, data, you have to have some sort of uh, mechanism to uh, to be able to uh, combine these different data sources. And that's one of the, the challenges that uh, uh, enterprises face. So uh, let's talk about big data challenges. So uh, the emergence of new uh, connected devices and cloud-borne applications uh, you know, at the end, it's resulting in uh, you know a massive explosion of uh, data volumes. Uh, we're now creating more data in minutes than what we were able to accumulate in decades. Uh, as an example, uh, you know, most power utility companies uh, started deploying smart meter uh, uh, solutions or uh, smart internet connected power meters since around 2008. So with this uh, smart meters uh, sending data directly to uh, the utility companies, uh, you know, what normally used to require sending uh, a human meter reader uh, to uh, individual homes uh, to be able to uh, record, uh, you know, power usage, uh, you know, now they can, they can send thousands of data points without a need to send a human being to uh, individual homes. Um, in addition, you know, uh, most of these new data sources are also introducing new data types and formats, uh, which would require, you know, a lot of conversion and transformation in order to be able to fit it into uh, traditional data types before you can, you can even do any sort of analytics or reporting. So um, just to summarize, uh, you know, the explosion of data volumes, uh, the emergence of new data types and formats as well as a major shift in the you know in the importance of data outside the organization as well as the increasing expectations for um, real time capabilities these are you know these are some of the major challenge to uh, the traditional data warehouse and you know how we used to look at bi and analytics so uh, let's move over to uh, the next section where uh, we'll talk about the history and fundamentals of uh, big data processing. Um, so uh, when we uh, discussed about uh, the challenge of big data, uh, you know, we talked about certain challenges coming from uh, increasing data volumes, uh, as well as uh, emergence of new data types and formats. And uh, we've also talked about the need for, you know, uh, real time decision making capabilities. So. All of this actually uh, define what we now commonly uh, refer to as big data. Uh, so uh, my best uh, definition of big data um, is big data is data that exceeds the processing capability of uh, conventional database systems uh, because the data is either too big or it's, it moves too fast or it doesn't fit uh, the structures of your uh, database architectures so this is a very comprehensive definition of big data you know it tries to encompass or it, it tries to touch upon all the challenges uh, that we have uh, on uh, you know using our uh, traditional means of processing data so um, with that because of all these factors you have to look into uh, alternative ways of processing uh, the data in order to be able to uh, gain any valuable uh, business insights so um, let's let's talk about you know how do we really uh, characterize big data. So I think these are the same the same things we went through uh, earlier. But you know every, anytime you look at uh, most uh, literatures out there uh, that talk about uh, defining big data, you'll see uh, mentions around uh, three Vs or the four Vs. So uh, you know. The three Vs are the most uh, uh, common ones. The fourth one is veracity, uh, which has to deal with data quality. So uh, let me go through the three Vs first. You know, uh, so when we talk about volumes, again, you know, we say data is being created at exponentially increasing rates, and most of this is attributed to uh, new data sources, 
um, including social media, intelligent devices, or Internet of Things, as well as you know massive explosion of uh, communication infrastructures. Uh, a good ex a good example of this is that out of the seven billion people that live in the world right now, six, almost six billion of them have uh, cell phones. Um, when we talk about velocity, you know, all of these new data sources are also sending the data at high rates of speed. As an example, uh, the New York Stock Exchange currently captures roughly around one terabyte of trade information every day. That's just massive amount of data being generated in a single day. Uh, uh, the average modern car right now has uh, over or 100 sensors uh, and all of this sensors are monitoring um, data in real time so there is massive amount of data being generated when we talk about the variety of data sources uh, you know there is a wide uh, deployment of uh, wearable uh, health monitors right now all these are generating massive amount of data in different formats so uh, we're no longer just processing structured data uh, stored uh, in the form of database tables uh, unstructured data in the form of uh, file storage, uh, image, uh, audio files is also very uh, relevant. As an example, uh, we have now around 4 billion hours of YouTube videos being watched every day. So, um, so when every time we read about the history of uh, big data processing, uh, we'll notice that big data processing really emerged from uh, a convergence of high performance computing uh, with uh, commercial computing. So before what we now call uh, internet scale computing uh, was born, most of the heavy computation was handled by uh, supercomputers, uh, which handled you know massive computation for very unique applications like weather forecasting, scientific research, and uh, military applications. Uh, as an example, you know, calculating trajectories for uh, missiles and projectiles, or forecasting a week's worth of weather, or in some limited cases for fraud detection algorithms by uh, some banks. So, uh, however, in you know, in the late '90s and early 2000s. With the emergence of you know e-commerce and what we call internet scale uh, data processing, uh, for companies like eBay, Amazon, uh, Yahoo, there was a need for massive data processing capability so that you know uh, commercial activities can can be uh, more efficient. So uh, one of the major outcomes of this was an increase uh, uh, in a shift towards what we now refer to as scale out architecture. Um, in the server design. Let's talk about what that means. So um, most server, servers that we uh, use for our applications uh, currently, they use what we call the SMP uh, architecture, which stands for a symmetric uh, multi-processing architecture. So uh, it's, it's a multi-processor system uh, where the processors uh, share uh, resources uh, like operating systems, uh, the memory and the uh, I.O. Uh, devices, and all of these are connected using a common bus. Um, so uh, when we uh, max out the processing capability of our server, uh, the normal uh, upgrade process is, you know, normally to just go out and buy the next bigger server that can, you know, take care of your workload. So this can continue until, you know, we, uh, we need another big server, and then, you know, we'll go out and buy another one so this approach works as long as you know we can always buy a server that can keep us keep up with our um, next processing workload or next processing need so uh, however you know uh, one problem with this approach is that uh, doubling the the specs uh, either uh, the cpu or the ram or the disk does not really result in double the performance or tripling the specs doesn't give you triple the performance so uh, that's mainly because uh, you're sharing uh, everything, pretty much uh, memory, I/O, you know, storage, or all that. So uh, for internet scale applications, uh, as well as you know, most common big data processing, there is definitely a limit on you know how much bigger the next server can be. In fact, at some point you'll hit a wall 
where you know you can't you can't find anything bigger than what you have mainly because you know the manufacturer doesn't even mix them because of uh, the economics of uh, you know building that server so there is always a limit so uh, now let's look at the second type of uh, data processing architecture um, so uh, this one is referred to as MPP or uh, massively uh, parallel process processing architecture so uh, this is a multi-processor system uh, and each processor uh, uses its own operating system uh, memory and all of these uh, individual servers are communicating with each other using some sort of uh, you know high speed messaging interface as an example infiniband uh, network so uh, this is like a bunch of individual servers you know independent shared nothing uh, kind of scenario where each individual servers are you know interconnected using a high speed network interface like i said a good example is the infiniband network so uh, the typical upgrade process for this uh, architecture it involves you know just adding additional nodes to the cluster so anytime you need to uh, you, you hit a limit on your existing uh, cluster you just add additional nodes to the cluster and this architecture has been proven to uh, you know have a near infinite scale you know you can just keep adding nodes and you know you can scale in infinitely so uh, when we look back at some of the notable uh, milestones in uh, the history of big data uh, there is clearly a shift uh, from a single bigger or big supercomputer to a uh, you know, a massive collection of smaller interconnected uh, uh, commodity servers. And even even within the MPP architecture, there is a clear move a movement, uh, you know, from um, fewer but bigger nodes in the cluster to smaller but, you know, huge number of uh, nodes in the cluster. As you can see on the screen, you know, these are two MPP uh, servers from uh, the past and um, the CDC uh, 6600 as you can see it has you know it's an MPP uh, kind of architecture but it's still you can see like two large uh, supercomputers interconnected versus uh, the view of cluster on uh, on the right you can see it has like very small but many uh, uh, commodity level servers uh, in the so the key takeaway from this is that big data processing is um, it's nothing but massive data processing capacity that is you know achieved by a highly interconnected uh, platform that's built out of uh, a collection of commodity parts and this has resulted in the convergence of uh, commercial and high performance computing and it covers applications ranging from uh, scientific research, uh, military applications, uh, law enforcement, uh, social network and e-commerce uh, applications. Uh, you know, shopping pattern identification, that's, that's a very uh, interesting uh, uh, application of big data processing. Uh, social network, uh, friend suggestions, that's all uh, done yeah, using big data computing. So now that we understand uh, uh, the core foundation behind big data processing architecture, uh, you know, and its applications, let's talk about uh, Hadoop. So the term uh, the Hadoop is now very uh, synonymous with uh, big data, and uh, I would like to take you know some time uh, talking about Hadoop. Uh, but before I talk about the details of you know uh, Hadoop's architecture, let me start by sharing. One of the reasons why Hadoop is very uh, popular, and uh, to be clear, you know Hadoop is not the only big data processing tool. However, you know it has to, it has really proven to be one of the most um, cost effective in terms of uh, storage uh, per raw uh, terabyte of data, and that's really one of the major uh, contributing factors for its. Uh, wide uh, deployment in for big data processing uh, you know you can really see how how Hadoop's uh, storage cost compares with all the you know all the traditional storage uh, solutions as well as even uh, compared to MPP uh, 
uh, architectures that are not built on top of um, Hadoop. So um, the core framework for Hadoop was developed by um, Yahoo in the 90s and uh, it consisted of a, a parallel execution framework known as uh, MapReduce and also a highly, uh, very highly fault tolerant uh, storage system called HDFS or the um, Hadoop file system. Other applications for uh, moving data into or out of the Hadoop cluster or uh, querying data were also added to um, Hadoop. But the main, the key component of Hadoop was really, you know, uh, uh, MapReduce framework and the uh, Hadoop file system or the HDFS uh, for data storage. And um, with recent uh, developments, uh, Yarn is now um, the foundation for uh, resource management as well as uh, it also serves as a data operating system. And in addition to MapReduce, uh, we now have various uh, frameworks for scripting or SQL-like SQL -like, uh, querying, uh, streaming, and in-memory uh, analytics uh, have been added. So um, let's now talk about um, HDFS. Um, in simple terms, HDFS is uh, a file storage and management uh, system. Its origin is very closely tied to uh, the development in uh, the emergence of st the storage operating systems, uh, which are you know independent of uh, a database or an actual operating system. And HDFS is very highly uh, redundant and fault tolerant, and each block of data is replicated multiple times. And there are three types of nodes uh, within HDFS, uh, HDFS or uh, three types of data nodes. And the, the three types are, you know, there is a data, an actual data node which stores the actual data. Everything we, we store in uh, HDFS or Hadoop cluster goes to a data node ultimately. And there is a name node which uh, is a directory that tells us where uh, that specific uh, data is stored and the backup node is a backup to the name node uh, just for uh, disaster recovery purposes so every time a query is sent out the name node has to identify where that specific data that's needed for that query is stored and that's basically the the purpose of the so um, now that we know that Hadoop uses a highly uh, replicated uh, data storage mechanism uh, that uses, you know, uh, data nodes to store data and a name node to identify where the data is stored in the cluster. Let's look into how data is processed and uh, queried. So, uh, as explained earlier, uh, the original query framework for Hadoop is uh, MapReduce, and it is based on uh, map functions and radius functions. Uh, the map functions basically uh, take a task or a query and break it down into smaller subtasks. The reduce function uh, does the opposite, you know, once the queries are computed and the results are um, identified, the reduce function combines those partial answers to find or to generate the combined result. Um, in terms of nodes, uh, just like the case of HDFS, in the case of MapReduce, we also have two types of nodes. We have the master node or the job tracker and the slave or the uh, worker uh, or the task tracker nodes uh, which do uh, the actual work. So when a query is sent out, it goes to the master or the job tracker, which, uh, you know, once it receives the, the query, it starts identifying which task trackers can do uh, the map and the reduce tasks. and those queries are, or sub-queries are sent to those uh, individual task trackers uh, for computation. So um, let's now use a very simple example to explain uh, how uh, MapReduce works. So um, consider a scenario where uh, we need to count money. And let's use an example where we have uh, four uh, bundles of uh, $100 bills and uh, each bundle will have 
hundred bills in it. So we have a total of four hundred bills. Um, so uh, and we have an employee, uh, as you can see in the diagram, who can count at a rate of one bill per second. So if you give him five individual bills, it will take him five seconds. So for this specific example, if we give him all the four bundles of uh, cash, and he, we know he can count, he's, he's the fastest he can count is at one bill per second, and it's a really good day for him. He's on top of his game. Uh, he can uh, he can go ahead and count all the cash for us in a total of 400 seconds um, Now What if we need the job done faster? So uh, we can either uh, you know add another employee uh, to help him out or we can probably uh, get a, uh, a different just you know a new employee who we know is faster at counting cash so let's let's uh, deal with the first scenario. So um, we can uh, evenly divide uh, the bundles of cash and uh, get the two employees to count independently. Uh, so here is here is the scenario. So since we know you know the second employee is um, you know equally fast at counting cash. Um, and we've split the uh, total uh, amount of tasks that they have to do by you know splitting the, 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 the bundles of cash. Now, uh, once they're done counting, you know the total time it takes to do the, the job will be you know half of what it took the first guy. So this is kind of the fundamental of parallel processing. you know two individual uh, worker nodes uh, working in parallel, you know uh, to achieve a, a common goal. Now um, let's talk about uh, what if we can we can divide this into four and see another scenario. Um, now we have four employees and we've divided uh, the task into uh, four actually. So now, as we keep adding more and more employees, we clearly see a you know a clearly linear decrease in the total time it takes uh, to 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 do the job. So the, as we increase this, you know, as we increase the number of employees who do the job, and we we keep splitting the the work, we are getting into what we call uh, massively um, parallel processing. So now let's go back to uh, MapReduce. Uh, you know, we we started talking about MapReduce. So let's add a fifth person who is in charge of uh, four tasks like this. So uh, this person in the middle, he has four tasks. The first task would be, he would be responsible for receiving the query, which is, um, you know, the request to count cash. And then, and he has the cash too. So, and then he will be responsible uh, to send a request to all the you know individual employees uh, in this example four four of them uh, to uh, to perform the actual count and then once he sends the request he'll wait uh, until they finish uh, counting so as each individual employee finishes their counting you know they go back and report to him what total the total they have or the subtotal um, from their count now his third task would be you know once he gets the total from each person the subtotal from each person he combines the results and his fourth task would be uh, you know he reports back uh, the total the grand total so that now is a good example of MapReduce where we're seeing a unit of task being broken down into subtasks distributed into uh, individual uh, nodes that are working independently of each other and then once uh, the work, the individual subtasks are completed, uh, the results are combined and sent back to uh, whoever uh, requested the, 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 the specific task to be done. So now uh, let's look at how it all comes together uh, now that we understand the basics of uh, MapReduce. So uh, we have a distributed uh, data storage mechanism and uh, a data, a data um, a processing framework that can break down you know, units of uh, work or tasks into uh, subtasks that are you know, uh, processed by the nodes in the cluster 
uh, which have a local directly attached storage uh, for data and hence they uh, you know they really minimize the IO uh, contention and this results um, the, you know the individual uh, computational results are sent back to the job tracker or the master uh, using high speed network connections so as you can see on the right uh, these are actual name nodes and data nodes and the storage mechanism is directly uh, attached or it's it's built into that data node uh, so it makes it easy for you know all that communication between uh, compute and storage uh, to happen locally um, let's now you know look into how we can uh, write queries for uh, big data processing um, so uh, MapReduce is written in Java and it requires uh, you know a bit of advanced understanding of uh, the language so historically there has been uh, a shortage of developers that are very skilled uh, in writing MapReduce code so uh, Yahoo uh, created the, the pig script uh, to simplify the development process uh, even though uh, you know it shares a lot of constructs with SQL it is still um, a bit complex and it might involve some complex programming so alternatively uh, the hive query language uh, was uh, created by Facebook and uh, it was targeted for uh, very analytical uh, users so uh, the whole language the whole hive language or query language is very similar to uh, SQL and um, it has a lot of uh, all the fun most of the familiar functions and uh, query constructs uh, that are available in uh, SQL so um, the learning curve and complexity uh, gets shorter and simpler as we uh, move from MapReduce to Pig and then to Hive um, and you know uh, the final point would be uh, let's remember that as, as explained earlier um, one of the reasons why um, Hadoop's uh, popularity is very uh, high is that it uses uh, very low uh, low cost storage uh, mainly because it uses uh, uh, the map reduce i'm sorry the uh, hdfs uh, system which results in highly replicated um, storage and because of that uh, you can easily use uh, low low cost commodity hardware and still be uh, uh, safe in terms of uh, um, uh, disaster recovery so um, let's now let's now talk about big data uh, solution deployment models, and um, so when we talk about big data processing, uh, we have uh, uh, several options. So uh, we can have big data appliances that can be um, housed in the uh, local data centers, or we can have big data as a service, both uh, PaaS and IaaS. So uh, before I go to uh, some of the detailed examples. Um, I want to start by using Hadoop as an example to uh, to explain some of these uh, deployment models. So um, the core Hadoop installation is uh, an open source project, Apache project, uh, available from the Apache Foundation. Uh, most of the branded distributions are actually derived from this open source project and these individual vendors like Hortonworks or Cloudera or Mapper, um, they would add optimizations, or I'm sorry, customizations, uh, as well as deployment and management features. Uh, as an example, uh, let's look at uh, Hortonworks. So uh, it, was, it was founded in 2011, um, and it, it, in addition to having its own uh, Hadoop distribution, it also contributes to um, the, the original uh, project, Apache Hadoop. And Microsoft is also another uh, major contributor to this open source project, and so is uh, Cloudera. And as an example, we can see um, some of the components that were uh, added by Hortonworks to, uh, to customize or um, to provide a custom user interface for uh, their Hadoop distribution. As an example, you can see all the list of uh, components and you'll see Ambari, for example, which is a utility that Hortonworks has uh, created and added into their uh, distribution, which allows you for 
uh, automating, uh, you know, cluster provisioning and management. Um, it's it's very similar to um, this is the Microsoft System Center in a way, and they hold they also have uh, a customized uh, user interface, um, and uh, this user interface also has its own uh, application architecture behind it. So on top of you know the the, the base uh, Apache Hadoop, they've added additional features uh, which which can enhance uh, the usability of uh, the, the, your uh, Hadoop cluster. Now, uh, going back to uh, deployment models, so uh, we basically have the on-premise deployment as well as the big data as a, as a service. So an on-premise deployment of big data uh, really involves a physical deployment uh, of either a commodity uh, cluster, a big data cluster, or a big data appliance. So uh, some of the big data appliances you can purchase would be, for example, the Microsoft Analytics Platform System, which in the past used to be called uh, PDW or Parallel Data Warehouse. Um, as of 2014, uh, APS uh, now has two, two components to it. Uh, naturally, it, it still has PDW. On top of that, it has a Hadoop region and a technology called uh, Polybase that will allow you to uh, query data from SQL Server as well as from Hadoop from that on-prem uh, on appliance. Um, another on-prem appliance would be the Oracle Big Data appliance or the Pivotal uh, appliance. Now, when we talk about Big Data as a service, it can be both IaaS or PaaS, infrastructure as a service or platform as a service offering. So a good example would be um, uh, or well, well, one thing I want to add is uh, a lot of these uh, distributions can actually come in both forms. A good example would be HD Insight, which is Microsoft's uh, big data as a service uh, solution. It's built on top of um, uh, Hortonworks uh, Hadoop distribution. So HD Insight is a PaaS uh, solution, and it has Hortonworks on uh, Windows Server 2012 R2 currently. Whereas at the same time, there is an IaaS offering, which was which became available very recently, and that's built built using um, Hadoop on Linux. So uh, you know uh, you have various options when it comes to uh, deploying your uh, big data, either in the form of an appliance or as a service. Now. So before I talk about the uh, big data as a service uh, solutions, I want to talk about uh, an on-prem big data appliance from Microsoft, um, the analytics platform uh, system, whose uh, very groundbreaking feature uh, is a technology called uh, Polybase. So uh, Polybase uh, bridges the gap between uh, SQL Server and Hadoop uh, by providing a single query model. Now with Polybase, uh, uh, developers can query uh, Hadoop tables using T-SQL queries. Uh, moreover, uh, they can uh, query on-prem or cloud Hadoop clusters, uh, and this provides a highly interconnected uh, and scalable big data in a box kind of um, solution. So instead of uh, you know a, a very um, big or huge um, Hadoop cluster, you can you can buy you know the analytic platform system, which basically is like a cabinet, which has all everything pre-configured. Everything is internal to that cabinet, you know, um, and it's it's a really good product mainly because it can talk to different Hadoop clusters, uh, cloud versus on-prem, and at the same time, at its core, it's SQL Server. Uh, it's an MPP version of SQL Server, uh, to be clear. So. Um, when we talk about uh, big data as a service, uh, HD Insight from Microsoft is uh, a very interesting uh, big data as a service offering. It's a PaaS offering or platform as a service uh, offering. Uh, it is very advanced and at the same time very cost efficient. So uh, also it's built on top of uh, the Hortonworks uh, Hadoop platform. Uh, Microsoft's offering has the added advantage of uh, even more cheaper cloud storage. So if you remember this slide deck, I keep going back to it. Um, uh, I was I was talking about how Hadoop is uh, you know very cost effective for storage. 
But one thing you can look at is cloud storage is even cheaper. So now when you couple the, you know, as a, the convenience of uh, a cloud offering with the you know, cost saving of a cloud storage, you pretty much have a very attractive big data as a service uh, solution. And uh, moreover, the, you know, the provisioning and uh, cluster management is all done uh, through uh, you know, the very familiar um, Azure uh, portal. And uh, Microsoft really provides very cheap and convenient uh, monthly uh, pay-as-you-go plans. You can always go to the Azure uh, price calculator. You can see how, how much it costs you to run, for example, a 64-node cluster or a 32-node cluster, which I know for a fact is around like $11 per hour. So uh, this provides, you know, uh, customers the convenience of a very user-friendly platform for uh, simplifying uh, big data processing. And another uh, key advantage of a cloud solution is the fact that it allows uh, users to avoid uh, vendor lock-in. That uh, usually is very common when uh, when one goes with an on-prem uh, solution, which usually is very uh, costly to begin with. So uh, since we've already covered the fundamentals of big data uh, and how we can uh, deploy big data solutions, uh, let's wrap up by uh, you know talking about some sample modern data warehouse architectures. Um, the most important factor uh, to consider when um, architecting a, a modern data warehouse is uh, making sure uh, we use the right tool or uh, the right combination of tools uh, for the right workload. Uh, although this sounds um, kind of cliche, a proper analysis of data volumes, um, storage costs, and then understanding the actual impact of an individual workload uh, versus the value it provides um, uh, in terms of you know uh, the quality of BI and analytics that we want to deliver, uh, that those kind of uh, um, details will will provide uh, really useful guidance around how to best architect uh, a modern. Uh, so a very important research uh, conducted recently has shown that <clears throat> um, low value uh, ETL processes are one of the major workloads on uh, servers that could otherwise be used uh, or better be used for uh, analysis and reporting purposes. Um, ETL offloading or ETL automation has emerged as you know one of the most common applications of um, uh, on-prem uh, big data uh, solutions, more specifically Hadoop, for example, uh, or even the cloud uh, Hadoop solutions. And this involves uh, using Hadoop clusters as a workhorse for uh, daily ETL processing. And hence, you know, uh, it allows you to free up your more expensive um, BI resources uh, for, uh, you know, high value uh, and resource intensive activities like in-memory BI uh, or, uh, you know, SQL Server all app cubes that way if you have a Hadoop cluster running side by side and processing your uh, ETL processes, you know, you, your uh, SQL Server, SMP infrastructure will be available for, uh, you know, more real time, more, more demanding, more, um, you know, memory intensive kind of uh, applications. So uh, in the ETL automation model, uh, what we're doing is uh, we're sending data to uh, an on-prem or a cloud-based uh, Hadoop solution. In this specific example, I'm sharing um, uh, an architecture for uh, a SQL Azure or a Microsoft Azure HD Insight um, Hadoop cluster with uh, data being sent directly to the uh, uh, Hadoop cluster. And then once the ETL process is completed, for example, data may be aggregated or cleansed or transformed. And once all that processing is done, the data can be trans uh, sent to uh, an on-prem SQL Server or uh, SQL Azure or even other formats, including um, uh, Power Pivot data models. Uh, the data can be uh, extracted and sent out as flat files. So all, all that uh, takes advantage of 
uh, the added uh, horsepower we get by using massive hydro clusters and then we can free up our you know uh, low power uh, let's say on-prem SQL servers to do other activities uh, and uh, in addition uh, hybrid uh, architectures where uh, on-prem data warehouses uh, can continue to process low volume but either you know highly confidential or data that's required for faster query response um, while uh, massive amounts of uh, non-confidential data can be sent to um, you know an, a cloud-based um, big data solution like uh, uh, HD Insight and once the data is processed and aggregated on the cloud it can be you know uh, integrated either locally or using some sort of data model to provide this hybrid uh, BI solution that uses traditional data sources as well as uh, big data tools. A good example is shown here where um, we have an on-prem data, data warehouse that uses data from either point of sale systems or CRM systems or you know multiple traditional sources but at the same time we uh, we have web logs uh, around um, you know the consumers uh, who are browsing our uh, websites for example this is a, a sample company that's shown here and we want to understand how consumer uh, browsing behavior really translates into actual sales. So in order to do that, the web logs can be processed because there is massive amount of data generated on the web logs and it doesn't really make sense to download it and process it into uh, a local data warehouse. It can actually make sense to send it directly to the cloud, have um, the aggregation and processing be performed using a Hadoop cluster and that once that's done, um, the data can be either extracted or can uh, a data model can be built which that where that data model can access data on the cloud and combine it with data on an on-prem data warehouse and drive analytics that shows how uh, users browsing habits really uh, impact their uh, purchasing uh, decisions uh, things like you know uh, which products were uh, most frequently visited but did we, did we really see uh, that same level of sales activity on those products that's a good use case for a hybrid architecture uh, as an example these hybrid architectures uh, are becoming more uh, more practical mainly because uh, it's now easier to uh, connect directly to uh, big data tools uh, mostly because uh, new BI tools now support connecting to on-prem and cloud big data tools. Uh, let's let's look at a, a quick screenshot that I took from uh, Power BI and um, Tableau, for example. Now you can see on uh, Power Query, for example, you can uh, directly connect to Azure HD Insight or Blob Storage as well as uh, uh, Hadoop HDFS. Uh, the same applies to um, uh, Tableau. You can even connect to Amazon uh, Elastic MapReduce. Uh, you can connect to uh, IBM Netiza, different uh, on-prem and uh, cloud big data uh, providers. So th this makes it very easy for us to take advantage of uh, big data tools while still using uh, traditional uh, data warehousing tools. A good example shown here is uh, a power map uh, report that you know takes uh, two data coming from two different sources the tables actually one of the tables is uh, uh, an on-prem uh, database uh, it's coming from an on-prem database whereas the second one is coming from HD Insight we are able to do that data mashup and uh, you know create some sort of analytics uh, using that that hybrid uh, data model so the hybrid uh, BI integration model, like I said, can apply both to on-prem on as well as cloud uh, big data solutions. And you know, it's one of the most uh, popular uh, architectures right now. With this, I want to I wanna go ahead and summarize this um, uh, presentation. So one of the key takeaways from uh, this presentation will be you know, a good, you know, having a good understanding of the scale out architecture, uh, making sure you have the right tool for the right workload. Again, uh, sounds like a cliche, but 
it is it's a very uh, important uh, uh, point to keep in mind as you architect a modern data warehouse and uh, choosing the right deployment of big data solutions is also another important factor mainly because it impacts the cost as well as uh, uh, some major details of the implementations of a big data solution and uh, as much as possible try to hybridize uh, do not start from scratch so those are uh, you know some of the the points i wanna i wanna um, make sure uh, that that we made with you guys with that uh, let's move uh, into uh, questions and comments um, and um, i think mike has already uh, collected some of the questions that were uh, communicated to him so uh, i'll start looking into them